Bueno, pues buenas tardes, buenos eh, días y buenas noches en estas múltiples latitudes. Bienvenidas, bienvenidas, bienvenidos sean a esta primera presentación del libro La trama de la vida en los umbrales del capital oceno, el pensamiento de Jason Dom eh, lo pongo acá porque justo hablábamos que qué bonita es la portada. Eh, esta es una compilación del trabajo y el pensamiento de Jason W. Moore, compilado por Mina Lonena Navarro y Horacio Machado, a quienes tenemos el placer de tener aquí en la mesa el día de hoy, junto con Jason W. Moore. Esta es, una, es un experimento en todos los sentidos, como muchos de los experimentos que Bajo Tierra Ediciones ha emprendido el año pasado. Esta es la primera vez que vamos a tener una presentación, diría bilingüe, aunque en realidad va a ser eh, con traducción simultánea de, algunas, de algunos eh, elementos y con subtitulado que eh, irá apareciendo solamente en las partes que están en inglés. Entonces, bueno, muchísimas gracias a todos por estar acá. Hemos... Sabemos que este es un evento que ha tenido mucha expectativa. Muchísimas gracias también a quienes se comunicaron con nosotros desde antes, a quienes enviaron sus preguntas. Eh, y bueno, pues no me voy a detener tanto más acá porque tenemos, eh, es, no siempre tenemos la suerte de tener presentes a los tres personas que, que participaron de este libro, ¿no? Ellos podrán decir muchísimo más de lo que de lo que yo como parte de Bajo Tierra Ediciones, entonces también por una cosa de economía de tiempos voy a pasar directamente a presentarles. Eh, el formato de este libro, como, es, eh, como hay ciertos retos para la cuestión del idioma, eh, será un poco distinto de los que tenemos normalmente, ¿no? Eh, será más bien un conversatorio con Horacio con Jason, con una serie de preguntas que ellos desde el proceso de elaboración del libro desde su propia experiencia militante y académica pueden eh, formularle que sienten que pueden nutrir, es más una, un formato de conversatorio en, en ese sentido y después pasamos a las preguntas que eh, muy amablemente nos hicieron llegar ustedes a través de redes sociales entonces bueno, voy a empezar quizá con eh, Mina Lorena Navarro ella es socióloga y profesora investigadora del Instituto de Ciencias Sociales y Humanidades de la Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, de la UAP. Integra el área de investigación de entramados comunitarios y formas de lo político y co-coordina el grupo de trabajo Ecologías Políticas de Aviala de Claxo. Integra también el equipo interdisciplinario junto con un salto de vida del proyecto Regeneración Ecohidrológica y la Reapropiación Comunitaria de la Cuenca Alta del Río Grande de Santiago. Es como nos da muchísimo gusto, parte del proyecto editorial de Bajo Tierra Ediciones. Eh, muy bienvenida. ¿Quieres que empecemos con tu primera pregunta o pasamos directamente a las tres presentaciones de, los conversa de quienes estamos conversando? Empecemos contigo, perdón. Eh, sí, bueno, pues muchísimas gracias, Laura, por la presentación, la bienvenida. Es para mí un gusto que haya llegado este momento. Hemos estado cocinando este libro, esta publicación, ya hace más de dos años. Hoy estaba justamente haciendo cuentas. En el 2017 eh, tuvimos posibilidad de encontrarnos con Jason Moore en, en su casa, eh, que nos recibió tan amablemente. Y bueno, ya, ya es mucho tiempo de, de eso. Pudimos conversar, pudimos... Eh, pues ir también imaginando qué otras posibilidades de colaboración podíamos tener hacia adelante eh, a partir de una apuesta común, una apuesta política desde el campo de la ecología política crítica, la ecología política del sur, como la estamos pensando en América Latina. Y bueno, de ahí surge la posibilidad de eso, ir un poco conspirando en torno a la necesidad de una publicación que pudiera eh, servir como herramienta para conocer el trabajo de Jason Moore en, en México, principalmente. Estamos viendo también de qué modo este libro puede llegar a otras latitudes este, y, y, bueno, pues que nos vaya sirviendo como eso, como un insumo, como una herramienta para tratar de pensar las propias realidades de las que somos parte en, en medio de esta crisis civilizatoria, de esta crisis eh, terminal, en fin, de este momento tan oscuro por el que estamos atravesando, 
en términos planetarios. Eh, y bueno, pues es eso, un gusto para mí que haya llegado este momento, que después de tres años que empezamos a conspirar en torno a la publicación de este libro, pues hoy este libro ya sea una realidad y que... Eh, pues a través de este libro podamos acercar algunos textos. Claramente la obra de Jason es una, es, es una obra, bueno, muy, muy, de una gran trayectoria, pero además muy diversa, muy prolífica. Entonces, en esta compilación que hoy les presentamos, estamos, eh, bueno, se han reunido siete textos junto con una entrevista que le eh, realizamos Carlos Piñeiro y yo a, a Jason en ese momento eh, en Nueva York hace tres años. Y bueno, a través de esta compilación fuimos, eh, el esfuerzo fue tratar de reunir los textos que ya estaban traducidos al español eh, y una traducción más que en este caso Horacio Machado realizó, también compilador de, 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 de este trabajo, de este esfuerzo y con quien, bueno, pues también hemos caminado ya desde hace muchos años y que también para mí, bueno, pues fue un gusto que con Horacio pudiéramos impulsar esta iniciativa, como muchas otras que ya también en estos años hemos impulsado y hemos caminado eh, juntes y, y bueno, pues eh, también aprovecho para agradecer mucho a Bajo Tierra Ediciones porque desde el principio, eh, bueno, pues todas las compañeras se sumaron a esta iniciativa, eh, le, les interesó mucho el trabajo que, que Jason eh, ha venido haciendo y como parte también de una línea dentro de la propia editorial, que es la línea de ecología política, bueno, pues nos interesó mucho, les interesó mucho también poder impulsar este libro que, bueno, pues hoy por fin estamos presentando eh, y que, bueno, pues nos, nos pone muy contentas a, a, a todas. Eh, como ya decía Laura, fuimos pensando con Horacio algunas preguntas que nos parecía importante poderle proponer a Jason. Claramente son unas poquitas de las muchas que quisiéramos hacerle, pensando también en las resonancias y las propias localizaciones más situadas que el trabajo de Jason eh, tiene para eh, América Latina y para nuestras geografías eh, eh, ¿no? y las latitudes en las que nos encontramos. Entonces, bueno, son algunas de muchas de las preguntas que, que quisiéramos hacerle. Y yo, bueno, quisiera empezar con una que tiene que ver sobre todo con cómo entender el momento, digamos, de estos últimos años, de estas últimas décadas, en donde básicamente eh, el capital como ecología mundo, este... La fase de la globalización neoliberal se interpreta principalmente como un nuevo ciclo de apropiaciones de frontera, una nueva ola de mercantilización de la naturaleza, de la tierra, del agua, de la energía, alimentos, fuerza de trabajo y de aprovisionamiento barato de estos insumos como un aspecto clave para superar la crisis estructural de los 70. Esto para América Latina, eh, así como también para otras regiones del sur global, significó una nueva forma intensificada de extractivismo, que bueno, conocemos como parte ¿no? de esta gran ofensiva, que por supuesto no es nueva, eh, tiene que ver con una larga historia de duración, una, eh, eh, un proceso muy largo, muy doloroso, de saqueo, de despojo en nuestros pueblos, en nuestros cuerpos, en nuestros territorios, pero bueno, que vemos que en las últimas décadas se ha intensificado. Ante ello, queremos preguntarte, Jason, ¿qué desafíos ves en nuestra región y para nuestra región en esta nueva fase? ¿Cómo ves el tema del consenso extractivista que atraviesa gobiernos de derecha y a los que se dicen de izquierda o progresistas? ¿Y cómo ves también a las resistencias y las alternativas pues, que se han ido prefigurando al calor de estas conflictividades socioecológicas que azotan buena parte de, de nuestros territorios? Muchas gracias, Mina. Voy a dar eh, lectura a la versión en inglés. Jason, the question Mina is asking is, from your analysis of capitalism as world ecology, the face of neoliberal globalization is interpreted mainly as a new cycle of frontier appropriations, a new wave of commodification of nature, land, water, energy, food, labor force, and of cheap supply of these inputs as a key aspect to overcome the structural crisis of the 70s. That, for Latin America, and for other regions of the global south, 
meant a new intensified form of extractivism. In view of this, what challenges do you see in our region and for our region in this new phase? How do you see the issue of the extractivist consensus that crosses right-wing governments and, and those who call themselves leftists or, or progressive? How do you see the resistances and alternatives? It's an uh, important question. And I think that the first step is always to situate these leftist extractivist governments historically. This is the problem of national liberation across the past long century, from the early 20th century, certainly from the great uh, national liberation revolutions of Mexico and Russia, very peculiar uh, and interesting kinds of places. Uh, but in both, the, the pressures were uh, in very broad strokes uh, similar, that is, how to forge a developmentalist strategy within capitalism. And although the Soviet Union looks as if it delinked, to use Samir Amin's phrase, more, uh, that in fact was quite ephemeral and uh, the Soviet Union was always within the capitalist world ecology. In both cases, we see variations of neo-mercantilist development, that is, use the power of the state to either develop an industrial bourgeoisie or to engage in a kind of uh, what Prayer Brzezinski called socialist primitive accumulation in order to build a state that could survive in the face of great empires. In the case of the Soviets, of course, that was German fascism or what became German fascism. In the case of uh, Mexico, what is the expression uh, uh, so close to the United States, so far from God? Uh, that the question of imperialism and of the continuous threat of not only economic sabotage, but of, of imperialist intervention has to be reckoned with. Now, the other very, very difficult element of this question, we could spend all day talking about this question, but the other element of this question uh, is, uh, I think, precisely that, uh, how does one defend even modest progressive gains? So even a social democratic project in the history of Latin America has been subjected to military coups and uh, 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 prodigious violence. And so when we are talking about this issue of extractivism, it seems to me that we are dealing with a very difficult dynamic. On the one hand, local solutions are impossible under, under capitalism, because to the extent the local conditions and local movements uh, present a formidable challenge to capital, they will be undermined through economic dirty tricks, economic sabotage, Secretary of State Kissinger in 1972 saying we must make Chile scream, uh, but then also the direct, uh, uh, direct military intervention, which is always there. And so we need to wrestle with really the long 20th century question of socialism in one country, and is that socialism at all, or to what degree do we think of that as socialism within capitalism? Uh, one of the errors, but I'm not sure if it was an escapable or avoidable error, was to see nature as a productive asset, that is to adopt a capitalist gaze upon the web of life and to convert that into natures to be mobilized for the accumulation process. For the Soviets and the Chinese, that was socialist accumulation. For imperialists, that was capital accumulation. Uh, uh, but uh, in the, the qualitative differences in those strategies remains to be seen. So, it's a very difficult situation in which local conditions, national conditions have to be addressed. And at the same time, the possibilities for socialism are clearly circumscribed uh, insofar as the imperialist powers in the United States above all retains its overwhelming military and economic dominance. We can continue beyond that. For a start. 
I think we're covered. Thank you very much. Um, okay, perfect. I'm going to pass the word to Horacio Machado. First, I'm going to present him. Eh, bueno, uno de los... Muchísimas gracias por, por esta introducción tan ilustrativa de parte tanto de Mina como de, como de Jason. Eh, voy a dar la palabra a Horacio Machado Araoz. Eh, antes, bueno, quisiera hacer una pequeña presentación. El, bueno, es, de, es originario de Catama, Catamaraca, Cat, perdón, Catamarca, Argentina. Es investigador del CONICET y profesor de Sociología en la Facultad de Humanidades de la Universidad Nacional de Catamarca. Es aprendiz y acompañante de las luchas populares de nuestra América. Participa en el colectivo de investigación en Ecología Política del Sur. Es autor de Potosí, El Origen, Genealogía de la Minería Contemporánea, editado en Argentina, Bolivia, Perú, Ecuador y Brasil, así como de otros libros en coautoría sobre minería, extractivismo y ecología política. Y además, bueno, es co-compilador del libro que estamos presentando hoy. Eh, Horacio, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Tienes la palabra. Bueno, muchas gracias, Laura. Eh, buenas tardes, buenos días, buenas noches. Eh, bueno, quiero agradecer enormemente a las compañeras de Bajo Tierra por esta enorme este, y auspiciosa eh, edición de este, de este libro que realmente nos parece muy importante. Agradecer a Mina también por hacernos parte y haber llevado adelante este, este proyecto. Y por supuesto, ¿no? agradecer a Jason la, la, la generosidad de, de, de su trabajo que nos pareció con Mina, este, digamos, un trabajo muy fecundo y muy provocativo para, para pensarnos desde, desde el sur global. Así que bueno, eh, muy, muy agradecido y muy contento. Y siguiendo ya con, con digamos, la serie de, de cuestiones que habíamos pensado con Mina para este, explorar las, las, las ideas de Jason, eh, va una segunda pregunta que son como, que van como dos preguntas en una ahí. Este, y que tiene que ver con la noción de capitaloceno que, que trabajó Jason bastante, ¿no? que bueno, en un sentido eh, habla la idea de capitaloceno de una crisis estructural sistémica, crisis civilizatoria, pero también eh, de una noción de crisis terminal, terminal en el sentido de que eh, como que da la idea de que la forma capitalista de producción de la naturaleza habría llegado a límites que ya serían infranqueables, como que ya eh, estaríamos en el último umbral de la frontera de mercancías y no quedaría nada, algo así como conquistar, ¿no? Y en ese sentido, varios autores han hablado ¿no? de capitaloceno como asociándolo a la idea de, de colapso, ¿no? La idea, Donna Haraway, por ejemplo, habla de que no es una nueva era, sino que es un evento límite. Entonces la pregunta, eh, Jason, es por un lado, ¿cómo ves vos esta cuestión? La cuestión de si habríamos llegado ya a los límites geofísicos, biológicos de la naturaleza, ¿cómo el capitalismo gestionaría ese choque de eh, esa dinámica de mercantilización con eh, esos inexorables límites del sistema de tierra, eh, sistema de vida tierra? Eh, por un lado eso. Y por otro lado... Eh, la otra pregunta sería, bueno, eh, el capitaloceno da cuenta de una forma hegemónica de producir naturaleza, pero por afuera o al margen eh, eh, hay también o habría también otras formas sociales de producción de la naturaleza, eh, ¿no? como las naturalezas indígenas, las naturalezas campesinas, las naturalezas de pueblos que no eh, adscriben a su ontología o a una ontología eh, antropocéntrica, economicista, como productivista, eh, tecnólatra, como, como sería la, la, la naturaleza capitalista. ¿Cómo ves vos, entonces, esas otras formas de producción de naturaleza, esas formas subalternas? ¿Qué piensas sobre ellas? Si podrían ser pensadas como semillas alternativas de un mundo post-capitalocénico. Outstanding. So, let me try to answer a little bit in reverse order. So, the question about alternatives. Uh, we should begin with a dialectical understanding of capitalism as a unity of difference. 
So fundamental to how capitalism as a world ecology works is the internalization of diversity as functionally necessary to the accumulation of capital. So uh, in Capitalism and the Web of Life, and you see this in the essays in this collection as well, uh, we understand that the dynamics of monetarization of what I call paid work rely on the appropriation of the unpaid work of women, nature, and colonies. So that the normal state of proletarianization, for instance, in the world is, as Emmanuel Wallerstein long argued, semi-proletarianization, precisely because proletarianization always depends upon unpaid work. And that is politically and geoculturally mobilized through law, but also through racism, sexism, and other extra economic instruments of power. So yes, of course, those practices uh, uh, that we see of, uh, of alternative and egalitarian food sovereignty oriented agroecologies and agroecological practices are, for instance, absolutely fundamental. We should beware at the same time of a certain romantic peasantism that perhaps leads us down political roads that we do not want to embrace. So we want to be careful on how we sort out this dynamic unity of differences. But certainly what we are seeing, uh, and this is spearheaded by indigenous movements, peasant movements, although really they're not the old peasant movements of a century ago, they're more semi-proletarian, semi-peasant movements, but that's a different question. All of these movements are uh, foregrounding uh, strategies of, of mutual aid and solidarity that are indispensable. And this raises the, the long-standing and largely unproductive divide within the world left be, between those who would prioritize mutual aid uh, horizontalist strategies of solidarity building with those who would insist upon a political strategy of, of seizing state power and protecting the gains of the revolution such as they are against counter-revolution on the part of the imperialist forces. Now, it seems to me that these are two parts of, of any successful revolutionary strategy since uh, what happens when the tanks and the drones and the bombers come. Uh, and this was recently uh, illustrated in Rojava. So this is not to say uh, that that was a futile or unimportant endeavor, it was not, far from it. Uh, but nevertheless, again, the classic question of state socialism in the 20th century has to be grappled with in, I think, very sober ways. And when I say sober, I mean without either the romance of anarchism or the romance of anti-communism, or the romance that uh, you know somehow the class struggle had been abolished in the Soviet Union, which it clearly had not, something that Mao absolutely understood in insisting that the revolutionary process was a continual and continuous class struggle. Uh, so we need to look at the question of alternatives, not just in terms of technique, but in terms of how we relate to the class struggle broadly conceived. And when I say that, I offer a direct critique to what I call the Marxism of the rich. That is the long tradition of Eurocentric class analysis. And, and we need to understand the very wide and diverse set of processes of proletarianization and class struggle that extend well beyond uh, uh, the wage form. So when we think of alternatives, we need to think of not just the technical alternatives, which I think food justice and food sovereignty movements have done very effectively, but also how does one build an actual revolutionary strategy out of that? That's important because of what we dealt with in the previous question, but in Latin America, we're by no means limited to the neoliberal era. The era of imperialist counter-revolution is uh, uh, as long as capitalism itself almost. And so we want to be able to understand not just how to forge the technical and mutual aid dynamics of the alternatives to capitalism, but we need to ask very, very hard questions. I do not pretend to have the answer, but we need to ask the hard questions about how to defend even social democratic gains against counter 
revolution. So we saw this very clearly in the 1970s, where even in the imperialist countries, the social democratic governments of uh, Wilson in uh, Britain, of Allende in Chile, of the Palma government in Sweden, of the Whitlam government in Australia, the list could go on for a very long time, of Manly in Jamaica, the Manly government in Jamaica, all were, were fairly mild social democratic governments who were driven out of office what by one means or another. And to the extent that they did come back into power, uh, they were properly disciplined to the neoliberal consensus. And so this is something that we need to go into without romance. I would counterpose that experience incidentally with Cuba's uh, immediate mobilization in support of the MPLA in Angola in the 1970s, a struggle that ultimately culminates in the defeat of the South African Defense Forces at Cuido Carnival in 1989 and the collapse of apartheid soon, soon after. So we have to be able to put these two moments together. It is not enough to be virtuous and anarchist. It is not enough to be romantic about state power. These are clearly two moments of the same, uh, 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 of the same revolutionary strategy in an era of climate crisis. Now this connects quite intimately, I think, with the first part of the question about limits. For me, world ecology as a conversation grew out of two decades of engagement with the limits to growth. Donella Meadows uh, and her colleagues uh, published the limits to growth in 1972. I regard it as a uh, groundbreaking contribution and at the same time as a fundamentally conservative uh, contribution that is pro-systemic, uh, uh, pro-capitalist contribution to uh, understanding the dynamics of capital accumulation in the web of life. And what I did in Capitalism in the Web of Life, my book, is to show that the limits when we are it, the question of limits is fundamentally a political question that relates to different qualitative fundamental shifts in the web of life. And so the web of life is inside us, it is outside us, it is inside capitalism, it is outside capitalism, it is connective, that we, of course, are bodies that themselves constitute environments for all sorts of other life, including, as we know, the COVID-19 virus. So what I, what I was trying to do in Capitalism in the Web of Life, and this is carried on in the essays in this collection in different ways, is to show how the, the question of the Web of Life is always fundamental to both bourgeois politics and to revolutionary politics. And that what we need to understand is that civilizations, or in my view, what I call world ecology, so capitalism as an ecology of power, profit, and life, they become vulnerable to challenges when they are unable to reproduce themselves in the usual ways. And so what I demonstrated in Capitalism in the Web of Life was that the climate crisis is an insuperable obstacle. And I showed that not by asserting the gravity of the climate crisis, which I do, I show that, uh, but I show that the fundamental relation of capitalism out of which grows class formation and class struggle is the relationship of labor and agriculture. So this speaks to the issue of alternatives and agroecology, La Via Campesina especially. But what I show is that climate change fundamentally undermines the capitalist model of agricultural productivity. And it, it, it is undermining the capacity for the expanded and continuous growth of cheap food which means more and more and more food, it goes up and up and up and up, and the amount of labor power becomes less and less and less. That is the history of agricultural revolutions. It began in the 16th and 17th centuries, not only in England, don't let anyone tell you it all began in England, but also in the Americas, especially in the sugar plantations, 
And that model has been with us all the way to the 1970s and 80s. It is now over. The causes of the collapse and breakdown of that cheap food, cheap labor model, that agricultural food model, are many. One of them is the climate crisis in a biophysical sense, but also the tremendous power and organizing capacity of La Via Campesina and, and other agrarian justice movements are themselves expressions of the climate, capital, class, agriculture nexus of relations. And so that means we can begin to look at the politics and dynamics of limits as fundamentally biological and geophysical, as fundamentally political and economic, all at the same time. Now, we might want to circle back. I've, I've tried to answer as best I can about how uh, people like Haraway are dealing with the question of limits. And I think that it deserves attention, but we can, we can organize this conversation uh, however suits your interests. I think there is also some questions from the, from the audiences about uh, some Donna Haraway's cafe. We can definitely go back uh, in a bit. We still have one question from um, these three first compounds. So, eh, Horacio, si quisieras eh, plantear la última de las preguntas, la tercera de las preguntas de esta primera ronda de co-compiladores eh, y después pasamos al público. Sí, eh, eh, habíamos pensado un, a, algo sobre lo que ya de alguna manera te, se fue explayando Jason en esta última respuesta, vinculando un poco el tema de eh, las luchas ecologistas con la, la lucha de clases, ¿no? Entonces por ahí pensar un poco más directamente qué piensa él sobre las propuestas de Green New Deal que salieron un poco en el norte y que también hay otras ideas en el sur en relación a transiciones socioecológicas como la idea de, de buen vivir o la idea de, de crecimiento, como una forma de, de articulación posible entre movimientos obreros, movimientos sindicalistas, movimientos feministas, movimientos ecologistas, ¿Cómo, ¿cómo ve él esas propuestas y sobre todo cómo ve la articulación entre el norte y el sur global en relación a transiciones ecosocialistas? So many important issues here. I would say this to begin with the question of class and the anti-systemic movements, to borrow a phrase from Wallerstein, uh, that Fundamental to my thinking is that capitalism develops through the mobilization not only of paid work, but of the unpaid work of women, nature, and colonies, in the words of Maria Mies. This is obviously informed by the groundbreaking work of, of Silvia Federici, who demonstrates that class formation and proletarianization in the origins of capitalism was irreducibly gender. So for world ecology, what we point out is that from the beginning, there was in action something that we can call a civilizing project. That language itself was not used until really the 19th century in a major way. Before that, and we know this from the history of Spanish imperialism especially, it was a Christianizing project. But the logic was the same. There were the civilized, thinking, bourgeois, or aristocratic uh, uh, humans uh, who were civilized, and everyone else was a savage and needed to be civilized. And so from the Christianizing projects of uh, Columbus and the aftermath, especially in the aftermath of the great uh, debates between Sepulveda in Las Casas in 1550 and 1551, but all the way through to the civilizing projects of the 19th century to President Truman's famous point four development speech in 1949, where he declares 80% of the world as undeveloped and in need of development, that is, in need of civilization. That is fundamental, that geocultural binary of civilization and nature in many different forms was present 
and operative in the operation of imperialism and therefore operative in the formation of working classes and accumulating classes from the very origins of capitalism. Now, where I disagree with the Marxism of the rich is that this process it was not limited to Northwestern Europe. Again, Federici does an outstanding job uh, at that. Indeed, if we want to understand the origins of, uh, of the modern working class, we do well to look at the plantation proletarians, that is the slaves of sugar plantations. We do well to look at, as we see in Potosi, in, Peru, in colonial Peru, at the uh, uh, coerced proletarians of the Mita, uh, 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 and the, Pot the mines of Potosi were only one of many Mitas uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, as I often say, why is it that we account for the origins of the capitalist scene in terms of England and not Brazil? Brazil is much more interesting than England in the 17th century if we want to understand the most dynamic uh, forms of, and the cutting edge uh, dynamics of proletarianization and world accumulation. And that these were class struggles from the very beginning. That the really the tragedy of a self-styled orthodox Marxism is to present the class struggle as if it's somehow over here in one box. Whereas what we in world ecology argue is that not only is the web of life present in every dynamic of social struggle and every dynamic of human organization from the family to the financial center, but that class struggle is present in everything. And so for, for me, I would see uh, the, the origins of, for instance, today's climate crisis in the 17th century, which was also a moment of climate crisis, also a moment at which the capitalist genocides in the new world contributed to that climate crisis in the 17th century. It is then that we see the emergence of a climate trinity, of the climate class divide, of climate patriarchy, of climate apartheid. And so the question, which is so important, asks about uh, how, how does one go about forging a strategy that would link various so-called popular struggles? And we are, we are in a moment where we need to directly and uncomfortably address how race, class, and gender fit together. The most common way is to identify race and gender and let class drop out of the frame. That's uh, dangerous and it leads uh, in, in political directions that very much favor the so-called middle strata, sometimes called the professional managerial class in the United States. Uh, we wanna look at how gender and race from the beginning of capitalism all the way to the day are intimately connected with the dynamic of class formation, class exploitation, and class struggle, especially but not only in relation to the super exploitation of workers and the rest of nature. So not just the exploitation of the proletariat, but the appropriation of the bioterriot, to use a phrase from Stephen Collis. That is the unpaid work of nature as a whole. Thank you so much, Jason, for this uh, very rich um, look of all of your work and of your books and these very interesting ideas. Um, if we are finished with this first part, uh, maybe we can pass to the to take the questions of the people who wrote us directly. Um, I just wanted to say that usually when we do presentations, um, this part of the public, the, au the audience's uh, readers, is uh, doing live, is done live. So in this point for me, it's very clear that all of the people who wrote is already uh, to some degree or to a big degree familiar to your work. They've 
they've asked the questions before the presentation of the book. So if you want to go as deep as you want, that is this, I think, okay. Uh, I'm going to say all of this in Spanish. Uh, bueno, vamos a pasar a la parte de preguntas y respuestas del de, eh, público de quienes nos hicieron llegar. Eh, nos dio mucho gusto ver no solo que recibimos en este experimento pues varias preguntas, sino que además eh, nos pareció que hasta cierto punto eran preguntas pues hechas desde una lectura profunda del de, de trabajo de Moore, ¿no? Y previa del trabajo de Moore, cosa que es muy natural porque estamos pidiéndole preguntas al público antes de presentar el libro, ¿no? Entonces, gracias por ese esfuerzo, eh, gracias a quienes, a quienes las hicieron llegar, ahora vamos a proceder a darles una lectura y, bueno, pues ojalá que, que todos quienes nos sigan acompañando estén disfrutando de este experimento de de compartición de saberes más allá de una u otra lengua. Eh, voy a leer, eh, entiendo que las preguntas, Jason, you have already the translated questions, right? Yes. Perfect. So, I am gonna, voy a leer en español las preguntas y Jason las responderá, eh, las responderá en inglés. So, the first question I'm gonna read in Spanish is, ¿Cuáles son los límites del capital oceno? En mi opinión, son etnográficos, es decir, aquellos verificables dentro de marcos de experiencia distintos. ¿Acaso el capital oceno reifica a Occidente como fuerza motriz de la historia, haciendo del mundo entero un, es un escenario para... This part is in English, actually, so I'm going to read it in English. Yet again, tell us the protagonistic cost of Western civilization against itself e ignorando otros mundos, otras historias y otros futuros. En resumen, es la crítica, la típica crítica a la simplificación inherente en el determinismo economicista en el que incurren los críticos del capitalismo, con las mejores intenciones una y otra vez, y sabiendo que estas críticas les son familiares, en su opinión, ¿qué futuros alternativos existen a la narrativa del capitalismo en el capitalismo? Thank you. Eh, gracias. Excellent. Well, I think uh, this question about the Capitalocene is very important. And let me say that just like there are several Anthropocenes, there are several Capitalocenes. And so I think that this question targets a version of the Capitalocene that is not what I am arguing. That uh, there is indeed a, a Eurocentric and indeed Anglocentric vision of the origins of the capitalocene. This is offered by Andreas Malm, who gives us a very conventional and familiar story. He does it very well, but it's very Anglocentric, not just Eurocentric, that the story of the origins of capitalism can be told in terms of agrarian class transformations within England. This uh, 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 leads to, in time, uh, uh, along with the discovery of coal, mine, of coal deposits and the working of coal and the invention and deployment of the steam engine, this leads to something called the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is a story that presents a part of a much bigger story as the whole story, or enough of the whole story to understand what's really going on. For me, I do not believe that Europe as we know it today, I do not believe that Europe existed before 1492. I think Dussel is absolutely correct when he uh, uh, says the, the Colombian uh, 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 motto is, I conquer, therefore I am. Uh, I, uh, with Quijano and Wallerstein, I agree that uh, uh, it's not that the Americas were not uh, an afterthought to the rise of capitalism. The conquest of the Americas was not an afterthought. It was fundamental to the emergence of the capitalist world ecology as a dynamic of power, profit, and life. And so, Euro and, and I would also point out that there are many so-called European or Western populations that were not European and not Western and not civilized from the very beginning. The history of the Irish, and the recurrent waves of mass murder that swept across the island, uh, certainly between the 1650s and the uh, 1850s is a case in point, but also the uh, neo-colonial, semi-colonial uh, relationship of the imperialist centers like the Dutch Republic to Eastern Europe. That 
was not a, uh, the, the, that was not a quibble within Europe. That was a relationship between civilization and savagery, which is also uh, a relation of empire and colony. And let us not forget of, in a very stylized sense of bourgeois and proletarian. We can problematize those, but as tendencies, there's uh, truth to that, that the history of capitalism and the capital of scene is a history of the worldwide class struggle and the emergence of, uh, uh, of class formation that tends towards this dyadic form of world bourgeoisie and world proletarian. But again, in a way that is completely different from what the uh, Anglo-centric class analysis of somebody like Malm would suggest. Uh, now, there's a, an important further question that, that is brought to our attention here, which is, uh, if I am reading this correct, uh, the conflation of capitalism and economy. So for me, capitalism is not an economic system. It contains an economic logic of the expanded reproduction of capital. So that's the Marx story in Capital One. When I was growing up, I was taught to read Capital One by a great Marxist, John Bellamy Foster, who's not very happy with me these days, but I wanna give him credit, who taught me to read Capital from the end to the front. So we begin with the question of imperialism and primitive accumulation, and then end with the question uh, and the issue of the cell form of the commodity. Now, what that does for our thinking is it helps us to understand that the world market is an instrument of the politically instituted class struggle across the whole past five centuries. This is true for the great productivist revolution in Latin America in, between 1550 and 1700. And it's true, of course, for the era of the so-called Washington Consensus where the neoliberal debt regime is very much politically instituted. So for me, and I think for most of those in world ecology, we would insist that ours is maybe above all a critique of economic reductionism. That for us, the capital scene is not an economic story, although it contains an economic moment. And one of the reasons why we insist that it contains an economic moment is because the price of commodities and the price of interest of money is, uh, those are themselves weapons of and expressions of the class struggle. And eco-socialism has not done such a great job with its own economic history. And now that they've uh, taken an increasingly bitter and sectarian approach to other tendencies in the world around us, the question of capitalism's price history has been ignored. So we need to thread a needle. On the one hand, we do not want to be economic reductionist. On the other hand, if we do not understand the price history of capitalism, we are missing out on a huge dynamic, both of the class struggle and the web of life. And that will undermine our politics today. For instance, around the question that I think may be coming up around something like the Green New Deal. So for me, the story of the capitalist scene is not a story of what the West is doing to the rest of the world. But again, here's another messy contradiction. The fact that it's not the West that conquered the rest of the world, it is the, the world bourgeoisie that emerged first in the leading economic centers and imperial centers of early modern Europe that did indeed triumph to create this terrifying ecocidal, genocidal system that we call capitalism. So let's not pretend that the world bourgeoisie did not triumph. It has triumph. It is living in the midst of its triumph right now, and we are suffering from the contradictions of its triumph right now. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to pass. I'm going to um for the sake of the conversation and to follow the thread that you're uh, providing here, I'm gonna pass to, uh, I'm gonna skip one question and pass to another one. So in this case, I am gonna read it in English just for you to not lose on the text. Um, and then I'm gonna say it in Spanish for the rest of us to follow. It is, um, understanding the advance of extractive activities in the current capitalist dynamics, 
we consider this advantage, advance, sorry, on people's bodies exposed to agrochemicals, to the effects of pollution, etc., as an ecological problem. I mean, our bodies part of nature. In that case, can the social problems that advance on them be taken into account as ecological problems? Eh, voy a leer, es la tercera pregunta del público. Dice, entendiendo el avance de las actividades extractivas en la dinámica capitalista actual, ¿podemos considerar ese avance sobre los cuerpos de las personas expuestos a agroquímicos, a los efectos de la contaminación, etcétera, como un problema ecológico? Quiero decir, ¿son los cuerpos parte de la naturaleza? En ese caso, las problemáticas sociales que avanzan sobre los mismos pueden ser tenidos en cuenta como problemas ecológicos. Thank you. This is one of the most fundamental questions we have to face. And for me, well, you can see it in the collection of essays, especially in the discussions of Potosi and uh, uh, many, many of the other texts, where what I try to do is to show how the economic process of exploitation, that class exploitation, is also transformative, of course, of landscapes, and streams and all the, all the terrain of environmental history, but it is also transformative of bodies. And both a labor politics and an, and an environmentalist politics that fail to make that connection will be doomed. Now, in the global south, environmentalist politics have been much more closely attuned to these questions than in the global north, where mainstream environmentalism Uh, abandoned the working class environmental justice, health and well-being politics of various grassroots movements around North America. So famously, Lois Gibbs uh, from Love Canal in the late 1970s, where uh, uh, there was a profound cancer cluster. She was completely ignored, even though she went on to organize the anti-toxics movement. Uh, environmental justice movements in the United States in which brown and black working class communities were targeted as sites of toxic waste dumping and therefore experienced the bodily health effects. Uh, they too were ignored by uh, the environmentalism of the rich. So we have to, I think we have to as, well not just as Marxists, but I think for those of us who are concerned in any sense with the revolutionary possibilities of knitting together body, human bodies with work, with power, with the web of life. We have to treat this dynamic of the poisoning of our bodies as fundamental to the pathology of the late capitalist scene. Now, on the one hand, it is true that bodies have been degraded and destroyed and poisoned from the very beginning. Uh, in my own teaching, I often teach Marx's chapter from Capital on the working day, which, which in my view is the essential text to read if we want to understand the relations between life and work and capital and class uh, all at the same time, that there's a tremendous pathology to how capital reduces human beings to mere fragments and dehumanizes them, them, that is, puts them outside of civilization and into the realm of nature. This is, I think that this is so essential also to uh, Horacio's earlier question about linking together popular struggles. And the great tragedy that I've seen in North America, and perhaps it is different in Latin America, is that the feminist, environmentalist, and labor and indigenous movements have not succeeded in forging a common political agenda around work and life and the health of bodies. And we can ask why that is, but I would suggest that it has much to do with the problem identified by the World Ecology Conversation, which is the fracturing of these problems, that there's a woman question, a race question, a class question, an environmental question. No, they are all the same question. There are different dimensions of these questions and they work in specific ways and they relate to each other in specific ways. And if the left is going to have any hope of unifying a very diverse, a very large, but also very diverse working class, we have to be 
uh, uh, radically feminist, radically anti-racist, radically environmentalist, and anti-imperialist above all. This is the danger of the Green New Deal in the imperialist countries, that it will feed into an imperialist fortress Europe, fortress America mindset and practice. Thank you so much and thank you also for going back to this uh, very interesting idea. I think we are already um, over an hour, um, so maybe we can finish with this last question. We, we have also mentioned it before, um, a little bit of this very interesting uh, author, Donna Haraway, and there was a question from the audience about it. So. Uh, I'm gonna read it in Spanish, and I think you have it also in, in yes. English. ¿Qué potencias consideras que existen en abrir la idea de capitaloceno a la de tuluceno que nos propone Donna Haraway? Um, so, thank you. Perfect. So, Haraway's Cthulhuscene, which yes is just as difficult to say in English, uh, Haraway's Cthulhuscene is essentially her utopian imagination. And that's not a dismissal. We need that utopian imagination. And if you uh, sit with her text, uh, you can, well, it's a kind of meditation. So you need to meditate as you go through her text and reflect on the tentacular, like the tentacles of an, uh, of an octopus, her tentacular imagination. I think that's necessary. I think it's important. I think it's indispensable. It is not a historical periodization and that's not a criticism. However, we could offer a, what I hope is a generative critique. So first I would say much to her credit, after decades of not talking about capitalism, she is now talking about capitalism. And we want to underscore the importance of that opening, especially because many in Haraway's audience would prefer to avoid talking about capitalism. This is very common in Anthropocene discussions, and for all the problems of various versions of the capitalist argument, we insist we must name the system. And in, in my opinion, silence protects the perpetrators of violence. And so there is uh, an important contribution that Haraway makes in bringing back the question of capitalocene of capitalism to the center of her story. In my view, she has been, she was widely misunderstood before in her critique of the God trick. The critique of the God trick of the universalist gaze is in my view, a critique of how capital looks at the world. It is not, a, it is not to say that we should not understand she is definitely not saying we should avoid telling the world history of capitalism. She is saying we should avoid the universalizing tropes of uh, both centrist liberalism and certain strains of Marxism. So we want to s understand how capitalism develops and its contradictions. I think there on that question, Haraway needs to be pushed. And you see this especially with her discussion of population. And I'm not here to say that she's a Neo-Malthusian. That's not my position. So I don't want anyone to say, oh, Moore thinks she's a Neo-Malthusian. I don't. But I think this. I think that if we are to introduce the question of population dynamics, human and extra-human, we need to go back to Marx and understand that very short statement that every uh, mode of production and every era of capitalism has its own specific law of population. I think that's the first point. So we need to look historically at what in fact is going on because the, the driver of the climate crisis is not overpopulation, which by the way, always has meant too many brown and black people. It's never meant too many Europeans. It, it's been applied to other Euro so-called European populations like the Irish. Uh, so, who were not European at the time that uh, a third of the island starved to death and a third of the island was uh, uh, driven out uh, uh, to immigrate to the United States and elsewhere. But from the, here's what we don't normally hear, and I think here's what I would like to hear Haraway wrestle with in relation to this connection between capitalism and Cthulhuism. And it's this, that 
populationism as a modern mode of thought and a, and a modern cultural politics emerges in the late 18th century. Uh, it's associated with Thomas Malthus, of, of course. It occurs during the last great cold period of the Little Ice Age. It occurs, as we know, in the midst of profound and prodigious working class and anti-colonial revolt. The Haitians, the French, the Americans, uh, the Irish in 1898. Within England, uh, much of the English countryside had become ungovernable. Within London, there was the emergence of what is sometimes called Spencean radicalism, a proto-socialist working class politics. Th that Malthusianism, as Malthus developed it, was not about too many people. It was a direct political response to brown and black and white workers revolting and demanding autonomy and justice. Now, this is not the first time or the last time that it emerges at such a moment of political ferment. Malthusianism recurs at the end of the 19th century in the form of eugenics which is also in the era of the Second Industrial Revolution and the era uh, in places like the United States of massive migration, uh, of, of massive working class migration from places that were in the view of, of America's ruling class savages. These were Hungarians, Italians, uh, Poles, who were not regarded as white, by the way. So eugenics, which of course has an even darker history uh, culminating in, in uh, Nazism, uh, eugenics emerges as another neo-Malthusian moment. And then uh, we get one, another one, yet another one in 1968 with Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb. Too many people, again, too many brown people. But when is it that he's writing? He's not writing at a moment of environment, of global environmental crisis. He's writing in the midst of the greatest anti-colonial peasant and worker revolt and, and revolutions in capitalist history. And indeed, that's the history of environmentalism, of mainstream environmentalism in the global north, is to pretend that imperialism doesn't exist. And then finally, today, we have the Anthropocene. And I say this very consciously and very aware that it will, um, it will upset some people, that uh, the popular Anthropocene, which is distinct from what the geologists are doing, I love what the Earth system and geologists are doing, that's the geological Anthropocene, but the popular Anthropocene is a translation of, of bourgeois natu naturalism into social history. And that is exactly the political and cultural maneuver of eugenics. It is exactly the movement of Paul, Paul Ehrlich and uh, um, population environmentalism in the 1970s. And it goes back to uh, Thomas Malthus in some palpable ways. So Malthusianism is about population, but it's also about fear of the worldwide class struggle from below. Jason, thank you very much. Uh, Mina, Horacio, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Uh, we are finishing now a little bit over over an hour with this very, um, I, I want to say powerful, um, last couple of questions, no? And last couple of answers mostly about the, I go here about the, with the importance of always naming the system and the importance of visualizing things. And I think that is a part, maybe helping reproduce these ideas that help to see the system is what we do here in Bajo Tierra Visiones. We want to take part in that and for me it's very interesting how and, and this last idea of neo-malthusianism as a problem always of the black and the browns and not a problem of population in general that is uh, extremely interesting for me so i thank you so much um y bueno pues muchísimas gracias a todas a todos por estar aquí a todos por acompañarnos eh, Es un poquito más de una hora y veinte lo que nos tomó en este esfuerzo compartido eh, inglés-español. Terminamos con mucha fuerza, con mucha potencia esta idea de eh, siempre nombrar el sistema ¿no? y la importancia que hay detrás de eh, identificar y visibilizar cuáles son los problemas y cuáles son las raíces del problema y así poder también criticar 
eh, estos miedos que aparecen todo el tiempo, neomaltusianos, como habla Jason, ¿no? estos miedos a la sobrepoblación que en realidad, eh, y como él mismo devela, son, no son miedos a la sobrepoblación de todos nosotros, sino a ciertos cuerpos, a ciertas personas generalmente eh, racializadas. Eh, entonces, bueno, pues muchísimas gracias a todas a todos por estar aquí. Espero que hayan disfrutado, espero que no estén eh, demasiado confundidos. En, eh, y bueno, pues seguiremos siempre al pendiente de nuestras redes, de nuestros canales de comunicación y de diálogo para poder seguir pensando otras formas de eh, expandir y de llevar ideas que nos parecen interesantes e importantes, como, las, como el pensamiento de Jason Moore, a audiencias más allá del habla en inglés. Entonces, bueno, si ninguno de los presentes quiere decir alguna otra cosa, yo daré por terminado el evento. Perfecto. Pues muchísimas gracias. Gracias en verdad por estar aquí. Thank you so muchísimas much, gracias. Jason. Thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for making this book possible. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Jason. De veras fue un, una charla que espero sea... Eh, una entre muchas más, me, me parece que vale mucho la pena que sigamos explorando estos diálogos de un pensamiento, de un sentipensamiento postcartesiano. Eh, y bueno, ver ¿no? ¿Qué, qué viene para adelante eh, para que este libro llegue a Argentina, llegue a Catamarca y llegue a muchos otros territorios donde seguramente estas ideas van a resonar con otras coproducciones que se están haciendo desde los pueblos de Avia Yala. Muchísimas gracias a todas, muchas gracias compañeras de Bajo Tierra Ediciones, muchas gracias Mina, muchas gracias Jason. Y sí, vamos a seguir este, tramando y siendo parte de las tramas de las vidas reexistentes de acá desde el sur, eh, pensando otros horizontes de vida. Así que muchísimas gracias. Pues muchísimas gracias. Eh, hasta luego. Que pasen buena tarde, mañana o noche. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Horacio, Mina, Andrea. Mm -hmm. It's been my pleasure. Okay, we will be in conversation.